This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. Today in the Oncusine Brief, we're bringing you an interview with Dr. Michael Calagiuri, recorded during the 2018 annual meeting of the American Association for Cancer Research, AACR, held April 14 through 18, 2018 in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Michael Calagiuri is a renowned physician scientist known for his work in immunology that is focused on human natural killer cells and their modulations for the treatment of leukemia, myeloma, and glioblastoma. To date, over 1,500 cancer patients have been treated on clinical protocols that have originated from Dr. Calagiuri's laboratory. Dr. Calagiuri is the President and Physician-in-Chief of City of Hope National Medical Center in Duarte, California. Founded in 1913, City of Hope is one of only 49 comprehensive cancer centers in the United States, as designated by the National Cancer Institute. The center's main campus is located just northeast of Los Angeles, with additional locations across Los Angeles, Ventura, Riverside, Orange, and San Bernardino counties, and focuses on treatment of patients with cancer, diabetes, and other life-threatening illnesses. Before joining City of Hope, Dr. Calagiuri was the director of the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center and CEO of the Arthur G. James Cancer Hospital and Richard J. Solove Research Institute in Columbus, Ohio. He was also the 2017 president of the American Associations for Cancer Research, AACR, which is the world's oldest and largest professional association related to cancer research. Based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the AACR focuses on all aspects of cancer research, including basic, clinical, and translational research into the cause, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of cancer. I'm Peter Hofland, Sonia Portillo is on assignment, and this is the Onkis in Brief. Last year, following his appointment as the AACR president, Sonia Portillo, my co-host, and I sat down with Dr. Calagiuri to ask him about his passion, his hopes, his drive, and what he wanted to accomplish during his tenure as president of the American Association for Cancer Research during 2017 and the beginning of 2018. This year, at the end of his tenure as president of the AACR, we again had the opportunity to sit down with him. This time we wanted to ask him about his experience and how he was able to help solve some of the key challenges he had noted before. Dr. Calagiuri has been actively involved with the AACR since 1919, serving as member and more recently chairperson of the Publications Committee and a member of the Clinical and Translational Cancer Research Committee, among other things. One of Dr. Calagiuri's main concerns indicated in our interview in 2017 is the problem of cancer health disparities that represents a major public health problem in our country. By promoting the exchange of novel ideas and information between the AACR and a wide range of professionals from academia, industry, government and the community, Dr. Calagiuri hoped to drive a movement to help eliminate the disparities and harness the potential and maximize the many opportunities for bringing research on health disparities from bench to bedside or community and back again. As part of that effort, he wanted, during his tenure as president of the AACR, bring together scientists and other professionals working in a variety of disciplines to discuss the latest findings in the field and to stimulate the development of new research in cancer health disparities. And it must be said, one of the challenges society faces today is how to ensure that everyone benefited equally from the groundbreaking advances in cancer treatment and prevention. Cancer health disparities are indeed a huge problem. For example, African Americans have the shortest survival for most cancers compared with those in other racial and ethnic groups in the United States. Hence, there is a large unmet need to do more to understand the reasons for disparities as well as ways to address them. The issue of disparities is complex, it's multifactorial and it's a problem that involves genetics, behavioral and socioeconomic factors among others and it will require a multifaceted, evidence-based approach to solve the problem. 
In our interview, Dr. Kyler Jury is addressing some of the problems, as well as what he and the AECR hopes to accomplish in the upcoming years. Let's listen. Welcome to uh, the program, Dr. Kyler Jury. Um, Thank you. A, a year ago, we sat here uh, in April, um, actually in Washington, D.C. at that time, and um, you were just elected as the president uh, of the AACR. Um, you had a lot of hopes, a lot of uh, things that you wanted to accomplish in the year that you were the president of the organization. Um, uh, how did that go? How did that year go so far? I mean, well, uh, well, it's it's come and gone. As of 24 hours, I'm past president, so <laughs> I'm breathing a little uh, deeper uh, with a little more calm. Uh, that is to say that it's been a whirlwind year. Um, I was humbled and continue to be humbled by the depth and breadth of what our organization, the American Association for Cancer Research, does in literally every corner of the world. I mean, we are now 40,000 members, and we're in 120 countries. We're the oldest and largest cancer research organization in the world, and having that many constituents in that many places uh, puts enormous responsibilities on us to be responsive to all sorts of needs. So the most... Uh, impressive aspect of my presidency is what I've learned. And man, it is impressive. And it's impressive because of our leader. Uh, Dr. Margaret Foti is a force unto herself. You know, she is a force of nature. She's been with us three decades. You know, I was trying to think of an organization which has had such stable and innovative leadership over three decades um, that has grown as we have grown in that time. And I can think of no other. So she's unique in the world. And I've, try, I've tried and I've asked others. She's really unique in the world. So I'm, I'm, I've learned so much under her leadership. It's been wonderful. Now, if you, um, if you look at some of the things that uh, you were talking about last year, um, I remember one of the things that you were uh, really keen on influencing was the issue of disparities. And yes. um, if you look at disparities, uh, it's um, on one side you have people that overuse the medical system uh, tremendously. Mm -hmm. um, but the worrisome part is also the fact that there are a lot of people uh, who have no access uh, to health. Um, and some of it may be caused by um, re health issues related to race. Some of it may be dealing with e socioeconomic status. Um, some may also have completely different reasons. Um, so when you look at that, um, how did you, or have, you ha have you been able to kind of influence this a little bit? I think so. So the way, just to back up a second, the way I think of health disparities is in terms of um, cancer health disparities outcomes. And by that, just to define it, I mean five people have the same tumor and there are different outcomes based on, as you said, race or ethnicity, or geography, or socioeconomic status, or other barriers. And so that's what I looked at. And when you look across the continuum, African Americans are disproportionately affected. So race appears to be a very important factor. In fact, overall, you know, there's something like 25% worse outcomes for African Americans across all cancers. Hmm. It's just startling. Prostate cancer, they get it sooner. They present with later stage, and they die younger. Breast cancer, about the same incidence, but there's a disproportionate amount of what's called triple negative, so the poor prognosis, so the death rate is worse. So I decided to um, try to take this piece by piece and see if we couldn't get something important done during my year, and I'd be glad to explain what got launched as my presidential initiative right. called 2020 by 2020. Okay, let's take a short break here, and then we talk some more. If you're just joining us, our guest today is Dr. Michael Calagiri. Dr. Calagiri is a renowned physician scientist known for his work in immunology that is focused on human natural killer cells and the modulation for the treatment of leukemia, myeloma, and glioblastoma. He is the president and physician-in-chief of City of Hope National Medical Center in Duarte, California. Before joining City of Hope, Dr. Calagiri was the director of the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center and the CEO of the Arthur G. James Cancer Hospital and Richard J. Soloff Research Institute in Columbus. He was also the 2017 president of the American Association for Cancer Research. We'll be right back. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. Thank you. 
and welcome back. This is the Youngers in Brief. And if you're just joining us, our guest today is Dr. Michael Calagiuri. Dr. Calagiuri is a renowned physician scientist known for his work in immunology that is focused on human natural killer cells and their modulation for the treatment of leukemia, myeloma, and glioblastoma. He is the president and physician-in-chief of City of Hope National Medical Center in Duarte, California. Before joining City of Hope, Dr. Calagiuri was the director of the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center and CEO of the Arthur G. James Cancer Hospital and Richard J. Soloff Research Institute in Columbus, Ohio. He was also the 2017 president of the American Association for Cancer Research. So 2020 by 2020 simply said is to do the sequence and gather all the clinical data on 2020 African Americans, their tumors, Mm -hmm. their normal tissue, and their clinical history by the year 2020. And to do this, we want to do this in an environment which is conducive to consenting patients to what we call the total cancer care protocol. So that environment is to have in this case, African-American to black individuals, speaking to, consenting, and taking care of black individuals. So we, right. remove, we, we inf- reinforce the trust factor, which has, through our own history, been broken in the African-American community. So, so we went to a historically black university, Morehouse School of Medicine, and we asked, what would you need to do to accomplish this? And they needed to build out the infrastructure. So the AACR came forward with $500,000 to be given over two years, M2Gen, a company in Tampa, Florida, where our initiative called Orion sits, the Oncology Research Information Exchange Network, which I co-founded with someone named Bill Dalton at M2Gen, mm-hmm. and Pelotonia, a bike event that I started uh, <laughs> back in Columbus, Ohio, uh, when I was at Ohio State University, uh, also gave $250,000. Um, and um, we raised a million dollars to build their infrastructure. And we now have a business plan. Uh, we're now in the process. We now have the consent, uh, the total cancer care consent approved at Morehouse School of Medicine. We've got the team in place. We're hiring, and we're going to do this. And the reason why it's going to work is because it's going to be sustainable, because we know that for every 1,000 patients accrued to the total cancer care protocol, something called the Orion Avatar, where all the data is uploaded, they're going to get $1.5 million back. So not only is there infrastructure that will be put in place now with the money that AACR, M2Gen, and Pelotoni are putting forward, but there'll be a sustainable way to keep this going. If it works here, I know our organization, AACR, will pilot this in other minority, underrepresented populations. Yeah, that that was my uh, next question, actually, in terms of uh, you you look at the African-American community right now. Right. um, But obviously, America is built up of a whole set of different communities in that respect. Uh, Yes, and And we have to do that. And by the way, the data will be shared between M2Gen, uh, Orion, the the research network, but more importantly, Genie, AACR's amazing collection of 40,000 different genomes, and the public so that researchers from around the country and even around the world can look at all the Caucasian data that's built Mm -hmm. up but now have a substantial number of African-American genomes and clinical histories to understand, hey, in prostate, hey, in breast, hey, in all these cancers, what might be a genetic difference and move forward. And like I said, if if this is successful, I know there will be interest from the Biden Foundation, from the pharmaceutical industry, you know, from the National Cancer Institute. I'm quite positive about that. So uh, I'll be accountable for that, even though I'm past president, um, along with my colleagues at Morehouse School of Medicine, who have embraced this fully, are incredibly grateful to move forward with this. This is uh, President uh, Valerie uh, Mon- Montgomery Rice. And um, we're, we're, we're really, really excited. We're going to get it done. Right. Well, that's definitely uh, interesting news how to look at research from a slightly different way than uh, may have done in the past yes and and to look at ways to inc- include people yeah it's taking everyone's gifts so aacr we've got every cancer researcher in the world we know the genomics right uh, more husk school of medicine is a very focused passionate on improving outcomes for african americans right uh, so it's all good yeah. so um here at the aacr the meeting that uh, is just about to be finished uh, today um, th- there was a lot of very exciting research that was pre- is being presented. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it seems to me that there is a lot of attention for immune oncology. Yes. Um, everybody's talking about it, and that's definitely a, v- a very exciting field. But obviously, um, in cancer research, there are also other areas of expertise. Um, you mentioned um, triple negative breast cancer um, as a very uh, difficult disease to treat. Right. Um, looking at some of the posters that were presented here mm-hmm. uh, by researchers, it seems to be that um, there are a lot of different ways right now to uh, tackle this disease. Yes. Um, now, if you look from your perspective mm-hmm. and, and you uh, walk around in the poster hall and um, listen to the oral presentations, um, what are some of the things that, in addition to this, might excite you? I think the most exciting thing that I've seen at this meeting is the new focus on biomarkers. So we now know, just to put it plainly, if we treat 100 patients with the new immune therapy, about 25 will have a great response and about 75 won't. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be great? And that's very expensive. And, of course, it's very traumatic for the 75 that won't have a response with all that hope that they will. Right. Wouldn't it be great if we had a marker that we could take from the blood or look at the tumor and say, you know, you know what, there's a 95% chance you're not going to have a response to this. It's going to be very expensive, and it's going to keep you from trying something else. Let's not do this. Or this looks very, very promising for you. So throughout the meeting, I saw lots of early evidence of markers that are going to help us predict outcome with this immune therapy. That's the latest and I think the greatest because that keeps costs down. Mm -hmm. That keeps us from treating patients unnecessarily and dashing hopes of those that are so hopeful. And importantly, gives those patients, those 75 patients, other opportunities to explore other therapies that are being developed that aren't immuno-oncology. Right. Now, one of the things... um in biomarkers and uh, when you look at some of the diagnostic elements there <clears throat> we see um, a lot of attention to uh, liquid biopsies or yes. um, uh, the blood tests that yes. may help uh, find cancer early um, really early in some cases yes. um, it's it's coupled in many cases with um, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence is that um, a way to the future? Are there, is that necessary? I mean, is that not making things more expensive? Or is it helping to keep costs down by using those new, uh, new, new approaches? For example, uh, BMS Watson was um, presenting um, during uh, the conference. Uh, so it was kind of interesting to look at, at those things. Yeah, but, and there are many IBM Watsons out there. They're all showing early signs of success. The problem with all of these to date and a Mm -hmm. problem that will be solved is we don't yet have enough data because we are so different. So if I wanted to find 50 people just like you across the world, just like you, Mm -hmm. maybe your height, your hair color, your interests, that's hard to do right now. I can't go to a database and find that. Could be Facebook, could be. But those databases like Facebook, for example, like Amazon, they're being built and we're building those in healthcare. The numbers have to be very, very big. I think they are very important. General screening for the general public, probably not a good idea at this time. But screening a cancer patient for susceptibility genes. So, you know, at City of Hope, where I am now in in Los Angeles, you know, you come in with cancer, there's a good chance, a good chance that you might have a gene in your, that you're passing on that... um, makes you more susceptible to cancer. After all, you have cancer, I don't, for example. But to do this on everybody where we all don't have that same risk, we're not, that is very expensive. And mm-hmm. at this time with the technology, in my opinion, not very uh, sound use of our money. But screening a cancer patient to see if they carry a gene that's passed on to their others and then going after the others and putting them in special screening programs, that, that I think makes a lot of sense. Our guest today is Dr. Michael Calogeri. Dr. Calogeri is a renowned physician scientist known for his work in immunology that is focused on human natural killer cells and the modulation for the treatment of leukemia, myeloma, and glioblastoma. He is the president and physician-in-chief of City of Hope National Medical Center in Duarte, California. Before joining City of Hope, Dr. Calogeri was the director of the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center and CEO of the Arthur G. James Cancer Hospital and Richard J. Soloff Research Institute in Columbus, Ohio. He was also the 2017 president of the American Association for Cancer Research. After a break, 
We'll talk a little bit more with Dr. Carlo Jerry. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Youngest in Brief. And welcome back. This is the Youngest in Brief. I'm Peter Hofland, back with Dr. Michael Calagiri. So talking about screening, I mean, there are obviously um, different schools of uh, thought about screening. Yeah. Um, some say that um, um, depending on the protocols that are being used, um, it's overuse. Uh, sometimes, uh, especially in older populations, we may not necessarily need to screen as much right. as we, we do. Um, where does an organization like the AACR stand? Well, I think the AACR, by the way, when I say screening, what I'm, what I'm talking about, because, of course, there's mammography, right. there's PSA. I'm talking about, and I should have been clear, genetic tests. Right, okay. So, you know, the 23andMe kind of test. You know, you take a little blood or a little sputum and you send it away. I can't speak for the organization because we have not yet had a consensus, mm-hmm. but I believe most scientists in the field would believe that cancer patients should be screened for as possible carriers of higher risk for cancer and that the general population doing this in the general population it's not yet cost effective in other words we need to learn more about what it is that we're looking for right before we and we need to get the cost a little further down before we're screening hundreds of millions of people but if you take the you know 10 million people that, you know, might be diagnosed with cancer in a given area or given, given, you know, given, given year and screen all of them, you'll find a lot of people that have susceptibility to getting cancer much Mm -hmm. higher. They'll carry these BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes or other such genes. And then following them closely with the mammogram starting at the age of 25, with the colonic screening, with the earlier PSA, that makes a lot of sense. But that means that that you look for specific uh, biomarkers, specific populations, yes, and and that is not applicable to everyone that is out there. I, I, yeah, you 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 got to start with a hint. For example, uh, in Ohio, uh, when when I was there, we screened the entire Ohio colon cancer population to find five percent of people who would have passed on the gene, definitely going to get colon cancer because you have this gene. Find those people who carry that gene. And we found them. Mm-hmm. And then we went to the families and we found the family members that carry the gene. And they'll never get colon cancer. It cost us $4 million to do it. We saved the state of Ohio $40 million. So, you know, I like to say that if you think uh, treatment is expensive, try disease, right? We, yep. Cancer is costing the country probably a half a trillion dollars, like $500 billion a year. Half of that in lost wages, lost work. The other half in treatment. We're spending about $5 billion. It's costing 500 So it's about right. 1%. So if people think we're putting a lot of money into research, we're putting much more money into the disease, sadly. And so the answer, obviously, is get the funding up, get ahead of the curve, do you know, genomic screening for every cancer patient in America. You'll save much more than it costs. And it's convincing our congressional representatives, which the AACR does very, very well. Their policy is... Your policy team, government relations is a force. Yeah, that comes back to funding. Yeah. And, and there, there are always issues or always um, there's, a, there's a fear that funding may be cut at certain times. Yes. Um, where do we stand at this moment uh, with, with funding in, in, in general for cancer I, research, cancer treatment? Based on what I've learned from our amazing policy team led by John Retzloff at the AACR, there is no way in hell that mm-hmm. Congress... Our bipartisan Congress is going to cut the funding for cancer research. Uh, there's been just a, an increase that gets us a little further to where we should be, but not where we should be. There is huge bipartisan support for cancer funding. The, the Congress and the Senate are solidly behind the NIH, which includes the National Cancer Institute. So that, that is not going to happen no matter what the president wants to do or thinks mm-hmm. one can do. And I'm not suggesting the president wants to do that, um, but... Should there be a movement towards that, I am certain that there will not be. But what we it might be a cut. But what we have to, you know, since the doubling, we've been flat funded, as you know, right. for 15, 16 years. We're still way behind what would have been just a cost of living increase 
even with this $2 billion increase that comes this year. So we're not doing the American public any service by holding back on cancer funding. It's what everybody's afraid of. It kills more people than malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV combined. Right. We shouldn't kid ourselves about this. And we can get ahead of it just like we have the AIDS epidemic, which still needs our attention. But, man, we're making great progress. Now, also, if you look at funding, um, AECR is doing a great deal. Yes. Um, but you have uh, uh, the Joe Biden initiative, yes. um, the moonshot. It's yes. often, uh, as it was called in the past, I think. Yes. Uh, other initiatives, um, uh, Stand Up to Cancer, uh, a lot of organizations that are yes. out there. How does that contribute in general to um, making funding available, enough funding available? Well, what's really neat is you take Stand Up to Cancer, you take the Biden initiative and, and many, many, many others literally over 100, they go through the AACR to vet what it is they should be doing with their money because the AACR has the amazing research team to review these proposals to advise where do we need the money, lung cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, pediatric tumors, rare tumors. Um, And so you take Stand Up to Cancer. We're the partner organization with Stand Up to Cancer. There are tens of millions of dollars that they're raising Mm-hmm. comes through the AACR, we vet all of the applications for that money, and we award that money on behalf of Stand Up to Cancer. So it's a great partnership. Really applaud, you know, of course, uh, Vice President, former Vice President Biden, uh, the whole team uh, at Stand Up to Cancer, all of these initiatives. Uh, we got a wonderful uh, grant from AstraZeneca, got another one from J&J, Jensen Pharmaceuticals. So just and they're putting it through the AACR. And you know why they're doing that? Because we are the honest broker. Mm-hmm. You know, we have no, all, we would just want to fuel the best cancer research. Sadly, with regard to the applications, many are called and few are chosen. You know, we're funding one out of 10. And I read these applications. They're brilliant. From some of our young scientists, brilliant. And there just isn't enough. So, you know, we've got a great NCI director and Ned Sharpless now. And we've got great support from Stand Up to Cancer, Um, The Biden initiative, we just need more of it. Right. Now, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, A couple of uh, months ago, I was sitting um, in a plane uh, next to uh, an oncologist. And I think I had come back um, from uh, an an annual meeting from, uh, I think, the American Society of Hematology or another organization. And um, I I was very thrilled to see some of the things that uh, uh, were presented at uh, those meetings. And I start talking to uh, the, the, the person next to me. Um, what struck me as something worrisome to some extent is that um, uh, this is a practicing on- oncologist in a community center. Um, and he was um, very blunt in saying, well, I guess you, um, as somebody that uh, attends those meetings, probably knows more about the, the latest uh, research and the latest uh, developments than I do uh, working in a community center. Um, that is scary. I mean, what can be done to help uh, somebody in, 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 as a practicing oncologist, hematologist, um, to give them the tools that they can stay ahead um, and, and just be informed like um, people that come to an AACR meeting, for example? Sure. Well, I can, again, taking up, I can answer that on behalf of, as you know, I'm the president of the City of Hope right. National Medical Center, and we've just... Uh, acquired actually 15 medical oncology practices throughout Southern California. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. You know, it's very easy for me to say, well, they should take the time and come to them. Well, that's just impossible sometimes. They have sick patients to take care of. They have to make a living. And so what we're doing is bringing CME Mm -hmm. uh, credits locally, um, making them completely available through web-based strategies as, as well as Literally, you can get on the gold line in Los Angeles, come to the City right. of Hope you know, for half a day and get it done and not need to spend an enormous amount of money or an enormous amount of time. We make them on Saturdays, for example. So taking your NCI comprehensive cancer centers, um, all of which the leaders are all members of AACR, mm-hmm. and having for them opportunities through organizations like AACR to deliver CME material regionally, locally, so that... You know, the folks in the rural area can come in for a half a day on a Saturday and not skip a beat. We have to do that. It's our obligation as academic medical centers is to serve our community. I consider it a partnership, and that's part of the partnership. My guest today is Dr. Michael Calagiuri, the president and physician-in-chief of City of Hope National Medical Center in Duarte, California, 
and until April 2018 president of the American Association for Cancer Research. After a break, we'll continue our interview with Dr. Michael Calogiori. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Oncosim Brief. This is the Oncosim Brief. I'm Peter Hofland, back with Dr. Michael Calagiuri. We're talking with Dr. Michael Calagiuri about his tenure as president of the American Association for Cancer Research. Until April 2018, Dr. Calagiuri was the president of that organization. Now, um, our time is almost up. Um, so, um, uh, it's a little bit of a personal question. Sure. Um, as a, a physician um, working in the uh, in, in City of Hope, um, you deal with patients, do. and some uh, patients um, uh, might be difficult to deal with. How do you not take home some of the things that um, um, you may encounter? To How do you make that um, um, split to some extent, um, your home life, your work life? Um, what relaxes you in that respect? Well, you know, um, there are a few people that go into oncology that are, you know, continually saddened by the devastating consequences of a bad diagnosis of cancer. For someone like myself, when that happens, in the vast majority of instances, I pull from that the um, passion I have and the enthusiasm I have for just not letting this happen again. You know, I have a saying, and I I got this from a company called Agenis. It's their tagline, Mm -hmm. and I want to give them credit. The patient is waiting. We're continually inspired by the notion that there are more out there that need an answer to those three words, you have cancer. I've had the privilege as a leukemia physician to respond to that by saying, I have some very good news for you. And that's always the inspiration, that having had that experience innumerable times now with 15.5 million people in America cured of cancer, that's where I go. That's how I'm able to (laughs) compartmentalize, excuse me, um, you know, the sadness of losing someone and doing the best job I can with helping them through that loss before it happens in terms of alerting them to where we're going, bringing the family together, bringing proper closure because, you know, death occurs to all of us. Now, when it happens to a younger person, of course, it's just all the more unjust. But from that, I try to expect, you know, extract the hope and the optimism of where we can go and to remember that there are patients waiting for what it is we need and get back to work. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. In our interview today, we spoke with Dr. Michael Calagiuri. Until April 2018, Dr. Calagiuri was the president of the AACR. The mission of the American Association for Cancer Research is to prevent and cure cancer through research, education, communication, and collaboration. The AACR was founded in 1907 by a group of 11 physicians and scientists. These physicians and scientists were interested in research designed to further the interest in and spread of knowledge of cancer. Today, the organization fosters research in cancer and related biomedical science through its programs and services, and it accelerates the distribution of new research findings among scientists and other dedicated to the conquest of cancer. The AACR also promotes science education and training and advances the understanding of cancer cause, prevention, diagnosis, and the treatment throughout the world. For more information about the AACR, please visit the organization's website at www.aacr.org. This edition of the Ongers in Brief was originally recorded on April 18, 2018. For us here at the Ongers in Brief, we want to thank you, our listeners and underwriters, for your ongoing support. Thanks to your support, our program now has a wider reach with distribution via iHeartRadio in addition to PRX, Public Radio Exchange, and UK Health Radio. And you can also download our program via iTunes and Google+. In Arizona, our program can also be heard every Saturday between 1 and 2 p.m. 
on independent talk 1100 KFNX, one of the top 10 radio stations in Arizona, reaching almost 5 million people throughout the state. For more information about that and how to support this program, check our online journal Oncuzine at Oncuzine.com or visit our page at Patreon, that is P-A-T-R-E-O-N, at patreon.com forward slash the Oncuzine Brief. We know that based on this interview, you may have questions. So please submit your questions to our editorial team via email, Facebook or Twitter. We'll post as many answers as we can on our website, Oncuzine, that is O-N-C-O-Z-I-N-E dot com. If you're living in the United States and want to receive our weekly Oncuzine newsletter, text the word CANCER to 66866. That is cancer, C-A-N-C-E-R, to 66866. And we'll make sure that you receive our weekly Ongrisi newsletter. Thank you all, and thank you for listening. And join us again for our next episode. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Ongrisi Brief. The Oncazine Brief is produced for Sun Valley Communication by Peter Hoffland, Sonia Portillo, Evan Wint, David Kaler, and Sean Mayer, and distributed by InPress Media Group. Support for the Oncazine Brief comes from listeners of this station and our commercial underwriters and advertisers. For more information about underwriting and sponsoring options, contact Sean Mayer in California at 949 923 1660 or visit our website at oncazine.com forward slash underwriting. The Oncazine Brief contains health and medicine related information and is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended as a substitute for professional medical or health advice and does not replace your doctor's advice. Your doctor is the best person to answer questions about your personal health If you hear something in this program that doesn't agree with what your doctor has told you, ask him or her about it. The Oncocene Brief is in part made possible by generous support from Kite Rocket. Kite Rocket, making brands more valuable. For more information about public relation beyond classic PR support, contact Martin Pyrrhic at Kite Rocket in Phoenix at 602 443-0030 or visit their website at kiterocket.com.